This is episode one, the Federal Crowdsourcing and Citizen Science Community of Practice, FedCCS. My name is Sophia Bilou. I work at the U.S. Geological Survey as an Innovation Specialist in the Science and Decision Center. I'm also the Crowdsourcing and Citizen Science Coordinator for USGS, and I'll be talking also about the FEMA Crowdsourcing Unit coordination that I've been doing as well. And I'm John McLaughlin, managing the Citizen Science Pro Gov program here at the U.S. General Services Administration on a part-time deep detail from the National Oceanic or Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, where I help coordinate NOAA's citizen science efforts. We're gonna uh, present about our federal efforts and the FEMA and USGS work that Sophia mentioned, and then we'll have time for a question and discussion. But before we do, we wanna learn a little more about you. Um, thank you for joining us. So our first question, is gonna be asking you where you're from. Um, so are you joining us today from a time zone here in the United States, or are you joining us from outside the United States? So if you don't mind, if you could take a minute to vote, and so far seeing a lot of people from the East Coast. So welcome East Coasters, hope you're enjoying a beautiful day today, like we are here in Washington DC in the Mid-Atlantic. All right, great, we have a few people from the Pacific time zone, as well as the Mountain and Central. So, Thank you, but good to know where everyone's from. All right, we're gonna move on to the second question now. And with the second question, we wanna know a little bit about what you already know about citizen science. So uh, we're gonna ask if you're currently somebody who is using uh, citizen science, if you know a little bit, but you've never used it, do you have a general understanding, you're not very familiar, but you've heard of it, or if you've never heard of citizen science before this webinar, all right, great, all thanks for voting so quickly. We are seeing a nice distribution of experiences. So, um, we do have about a 30 of you who've used citizen science so far. Um, so during the question and answer session, we'd love to hear uh, from those folks and then a lot of people who have a general understanding of what it is um, and also excited to see some people who are not very familiar with it. So uh, we look forward to discussing uh, the tools with you more today. All right, on to our third and final question. In this question, we want to know what uh, innovation and crowdsourcing communities you belong to. A goal of this webinar series is to help foster communication and sharing among these communities. So we'd love to see. All right, challenge.gov community getting in quick. Um, federal community practice for crowdsourcing and citizen science. Excellent. Seeing some people from open opportunities. And we got a handful of others, so thank you for joining and look forward to hearing more about what other communities or areas that you're part of. Yeah, and it's great to see so many different communities represented here today. So thank you. All right, we are gonna close our polling questions now, and we're gonna get started with our presentation. And to start today, we wanna do a little bit of storytelling and go back and tell the story of William C. Redfield, who lived about 200 years ago in the state of Connecticut. And he was a saddle maker and a steamboat captain who liked meteorology and became an amateur meteorologist. The state of Connecticut got hit by the New York hurricane of 1821. It went basically up through the state of Connecticut. And William Redfield was traveling home uh, from work after that storm, he noticed something interesting. He noticed the trees had fallen in one direction in one side of the state and in the opposite direction in the other side of the state. And to him, this seemed contrary to the general understanding of meteorology at the time that during a storm, the winds all blew in one homogeneous direction. So he spent a long time taking careful measurements of trees and creating maps where he showed these trees falling in opposite directions and he hypothesized that that was due to a cyclonic nature of storms. These large storms, the winds were actually moving in a circular pattern. And 10 years after the storm hit, he published his observations and really not much happened. The scientific community said, well, the trees fell in opposite directions. Perhaps the storm came through with the wind blowing in one uniform direction. Then the storm turned and came back through with the winds blowing in a uniform direction again. So his observations were uh, dismissed. But William Redfield got a second chance. 
In 1839, the uh, storm of December came through Connecticut. And this time he was ready to harness the power of the people. And he had a network of observers, including some people on ships. Remember, he was a steamboat captain. And so he mobilized these volunteers to all go out at noon and collect the direction of the wind. And you see the map here. Uh, some of the vectors I colored red so you can see them a little easier, but there are actually more arrows on this map than just shown by red. And he pretty conclusively showed that at noon on this day, the winds had a cyclonic pattern. So he once again published his observations and he helped us contribute to our uh, current understanding that large storms do move in a cyclonic pattern. And he went on to become the first president of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, or AAAS. So there's a uh, little story of the power of harnessing volunteers. And that's what we do in citizen science. For definitions, citizen science is a tool in which the public participates voluntarily in the scientific process to address real world problems. And one thing I like to point out is volunteers don't have to contribute just via collection of data. They can contribute to all components of the scientific process. And there's a growing movement in citizen science towards co-created projects where the volunteers actually help come up with the questions and guide the entire project. Um, so please keep that in mind when you're considering these type of tools. And then in crowdsourcing, organizations submit an open call for voluntary assistance from a large group of individuals for online distributed problem solving. So as you're reading these definitions, you might be thinking, hmm, citizen science sounds like a component of crowdsourcing. And you're right, it is. And you'll be learning about some other crowdsourcing efforts going on throughout the federal government as this webinar series progresses. These crowdsourcing and citizen science tools have many applications. Here within the federal government, here's a, a few list of examples. As you'll learn more uh, from Sophia, USGS uses crowdsourcing to help determine what people feel when an earthquake occurs. The FCC has used it to uh, help measure broadband strength through volunteers. The National Archives has citizens helping to uh, digitize important works through their citizen archivist dashboard. There are efforts to get the public to help crowdsource maps. Nature's Notebook allows the public to help track the onset of seasons. By the way, for those of you who are fans of spring, it seems to be coming a little early in the south of our, uh, of our country, in California, Nevada, and parts of the southeast, but a little slow up north. So hang in there, it's coming. And then we also use it for things like measuring precipitation, whether or not you're experiencing precipitation, if so, what type. One thing about citizen science is new participation pathways have been opening up in the last 10 or so years, empowered in part by emerging technologies. Now, this image might be your stereotypical image of a citizen scientist out in nature collecting data, say birding, um, and that data has been and continues to be and always will be very important. This outdoor field data collection is also greatly aided by smartphone apps. These allow for uh, the collection of the data, sometimes even reporting it out in the field, and the metadata, such as photos, direction, GPS coordinates at the same time through one device, really supplementing what used to be a whole uh, backpack full of expensive equipment. Um, but in addition to the increase in field observations, there's been a real growth in online projects, some having game-like interfaces, such as this project, Foldit, um, which has support from the National Institute of Health. And volunteers can help discover new ways to fold proteins uh, through an online gaming experience from the comfort of their own home. In addition, there are projects that combine these two. iNaturalist is an app that does just this. They have volunteers collect hands-on measurements out in the field and report photos. And then they have uh, an online participants who help verify or identify, uh, verify the identifications or provide their own identifications for these observations. So uh, technology is really letting us do new things with this field and letting us creative about how we uh, combine some of these pathways. Maybe not surprisingly with all these new pathways for exploitation, the field is growing rapidly. David Hanich was a program officer with the National Science Foundation who helped lay the groundwork for a lot of the growth we're seeing within the field. And in a 2012 
um, blog post, he described the growth in the field as a common tsunami. And from this plot of the use of citizen science in a web of science search, you'll see that there really is a tsunami type pattern um, to how quickly the field is growing. And why is this important? We've identified a number of impacts citizen science and crowdsourcing can have. They can help enhance scientific research and monitoring, and we can talk through some examples. You'll hear from Sophia about how, how, how that can work. Additionally, these tools can help address societal needs. And finally, they can provide hands-on learning and increase STEM literacy for their participants. So this gives the uh, federal government tools to reach people um, in a host of ways and have a host of impacts at one time. So within the government, we have a community that works to expand and improve how we are using crowdsourcing and citizen science. And it's a grassroots community that's open to all federal staff, anyone with a uh, .gov address. And since this community officially launched in 2014, it's grown from a small group of us here in DC that uh, could fit around a table to have over 370 members from all over uh, the country representing 63 agencies. And we have monthly meetings and a listserv. And uh, the sharing among the agencies has really helped advance what each of us is and can do with citizen science and crowdsourcing. So I'll show you more a little later about where to join, but uh, from the citizenscience.gov site, the home site for our community, you can find more information about what we do and how to join. I want to show you a few things we've done and are doing. Um, the, group helped run a new visions in citizen science event at the Wilson Center in 2013 that served as the launching point for a lot of the work we do today. And then the uh, federal community, which we love acronyms, so we call ourselves the Fed CCS, was officially chartered in January of 2014. And in 2015, uh, the White House Office of Science Technology Policy, OSTP, um, released a memo to federal science agencies in encouraging the use of citizen science and crowdsourcing and detailing some steps about how to use it effectively. And the White House also hosted an event on September 30th uh, to promote crowdsourcing and citizen science and to investigate how the federal government may do so more proactively. In 2016, the site I just mentioned, citizenscience.gov, uh, was released. And in 2017, the citizen science uh, and Crowdsourcing Act was signed into law and our Fed CCS community was named as a finalist for the Harvard Ash Innovation Award, which we're very excited about. So in 2018, we realized it was five years since our launch. So we had another event at the Wilson Center, this one looking at um, a, a subject that we've come across as our community continue to mature, how we share across scales, be they drag graphic or otherwise, with our projects. And 2019, we're gonna have our first report to Congress uh, that is gonna detail federal crowdsourcing and citizen science efforts coming out. And I'll talk a little more about that report in a minute. But I wanna to touch on the tiered layers of communities. So when our federal community started, we were the first effort to, to tie uh, crowdsourcing and citizen science efforts together across the federal government to, to allow sharing. Um, and as I mentioned, we've grown to 370 members since. Uh, but a couple years after we started, a field-wide association started, the Citizen Science Association. So for those of you who may be interested in joining a uh, citizen science community but may not be eligible for the federal community because you may not be working within the federal workforce, um, definitely check out the Citizen Science Association, which currently counts as over 5,000 members. And also we've had continued growth in agency-specific uh, communities of practice. Within some agencies, we have communities that number hundreds of people themselves. And then as of late, we've seen a real growth in intra-agency communities. So for instance, uh, within NASA, there's a community at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center that focuses on citizen science. And within my home agency, the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, we have um, a uh, community for uh, our Sea Grant program and our fisheries program and our National Marine Sanctuaries 
Um, so we really have a tiered layer of communities supporting each other and sharing across layers. I wanted to get back to that report to Congress that's coming out this spring, because um, we're very excited about it. It's a requirement of the Crowdsourcing and Citizen Science Act. And the White House Office of Science Technology is taking the lead on finalizing and publishing this report, which is gonna detail federal citizen science projects conducted during fiscal years 2017 and 2018. And we at the FedCCS contributed details on over 80 projects, as well as broader agency practices that support them. So keep an eye out when this report releases. We're very excited about what it's gonna to have to say. So now I'd like to take a second to explore our site and some of the resources we offer our site being citizenscience.gov. So switching gears here, here's what you see on the homepage when you land on citizenscience.gov, and you'll see three main areas of resources, a catalog, a community, and a toolkit. I'll start in the middle with the community. Um, here you see the link to the federal community practice. And from within this community, you can see the info to join. So if you're liking what you're hearing and you wanna learn more and you have a .gov email address, here's the spot to uh, join our community. So I'll pause for one second and let you join. All right, thank you for joining so quickly. <laughs> um, coming back to our citizenscience.gov site, um, I wanna jump into our catalog of projects. We have almost 440 projects that have been reported throughout the federal government. And you can search them by their status, whether they're currently open or closed, by their agency, by the field of science. Um, the hope is that you can help find projects that match your need. And if you're looking to start a project, we strongly suggest you come here and see what's out there first, either to see if there may be a project that meets your needs or to see if there are projects you can learn from. And finally, our toolkit. Our toolkit of resources is uh, publicly available to all, although it's specifically designed for federal practitioners to uh, start and run citizen science projects within their agencies. And it has a how-to step-by-step section that will guide you through starting such a project. Um, and the first step is scope your project. And you'll see steps and resources for each uh, step. And one of the first things you wanna look at is, is crowdsourcing and citizen science really the appropriate tool for the, the problem you have in mind. Um, in addition to the steps, we have a collection of resources, and then we have case study overview. And within the case study overview, um, you can learn about a number of successful projects from the federal government. And I'm gonna highlight one from the National Air and Space Administration, DIS Detective. And this is a project that has uh, citizen scientists looking at um, telescope images of stars to try to determine which have disks around them that might be supporting the formation of planets. Um, so you can do citizen science work that is out of this world. And one final note about our citizen science uh, doc of site is that the usage of it is growing. So we're really happy to see this continued use. We updated the site to a new platform in January of 2018. And as you can see in uh, 2019, um, the uh, use of the site has grown with March being far and away our uh, most used month of the existence of our site. Um, so that's it, I'm gonna pause there. Do we wanna take a question? So I think we have one question that's come in so far. Yes, Nina Burkett would like to know if national Labs are eligible to use FedCCS uh, and citizenscience.gov? That's a great question, Lena. I'll have to get back to you with uh, National Labs. Um, if you have a .gov email address, the answer is certainly yes. Um, if not, I'm not too familiar with, uh, with how the structure of the National Labs is set up, uh, but great question, and I'd uh, love to talk with you more. All right, so, um, if you have other questions, you can connect with us through Twitter at, at FedSci. Um, we want to say we really benefit from sharing lessons learned and best practices, and we're looking for ways to communicate, to collaborate with other communities, um, potentially designated representatives, ideas for specific partnership opportunities, 
And we definitely look forward to working uh, to meeting more of you and learning more about what you do as this webinar series progresses. And so now I'm gonna turn things over to my colleague Sophia to go over some of the uh, exciting examples of crowdsourcing and science in action. Thank you. Well, that was great. Thank you for the overview of our federal community. Uh, one thing I met, forgot to mention was I am also a co-chair of this federal community practice. And um, that was a great overview of some of the, the amazing resources we've done. What I hope to do today is just to talk to you a little bit about the hazard related to the science projects we've been doing at the US Geological Survey and also some of the disaster related crowdsourcing activities at the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA. So um, one thing that uh, is our probably most well known project at USGS is did you feel it? So anytime anyone feels um, an earthquake, we ask them to just go online to our website and fill out a simple questionnaire. Basically, it's simple things that anyone can perceive. Did any pictures frame move? Did um, any appliances move? And any of that qualitative kind of experience of that shaking that you felt is then turned into these quantitative um, and, and community intensity maps that are then fed into our authoritative earthquake products such as ShakeNet. So a really great example of how we've already operationalized in some ways the use of this crowd data. Another project that I had a chance to work at when I was at the National Earthquake Information Center is Tweet Earthquake Dispatch. So essentially we mine Twitter for any time people tweet about feeling an earthquake. And all those blue dots are actually examples of how we've been able to detect earthquakes faster than our seismometers just by mining Twitter data. And essentially um, we are able to actually detect earthquakes sometimes easier than um, we would with seismometers because we cannot put seismometers everywhere in every location. So another really interesting example of how we're leveraging social media. Um, another example that we've done um, in Florida when I was working at the Coastal Marine Science Center is we would ask people to look at and compare the images from um, aerial photos before and after a storm hits the coast. And so we essentially ask people to identify what changes do they see. And the goal of this project is really to improve our prediction models of coastal erosion. So it's, it's helping to um, validate and enhance our models, but also in that same process, um, it educates the public about what happens to our coastlines, what happens when you live on the coast. It's just an ob obviously a, best, a cost effective way to classify a large number of images. So in the last two years in uh, the hurricane season 2017, 2018, I had a chance to establish this FEMA crowdsourcing unit uh, with my colleague, Emily Marticello. And essentially one of the things that we've done is we first started with Hurricane Maria, but since then have been activated for three other hurricanes. During steady state, we also developed a playbook to really start to figure out how do we operationalize this effort within that bureau. But uh, I, what I wanna do is just give you an idea of some of the various kinds of activities we had um, coordinated in terms of the crowdsourced products that came out of these activations. So the first example that really was to kind of explain to folks at FEMA of the value of crowdsourcing is uh, the previous administrator at the time, Brock Long, had asked, what's the status of 71 hospitals in Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria hit? And essentially in um, 36 hours, 50, over 55 volunteers from the standby task force uh, were able to provide more, faster, and different updates than the official efforts. And essentially these volunteers were just curating information online, um, both from official and unofficial sources and putting it all together on a map, as opposed to the official side actually on the ground trying to get status updates individually from each hospital. It's a really interesting example. Another example is how we have been um, leveraging civil air patrol images, asking the crowd to identify what level of damage they see. Is it minor, major? Um, essentially the goal was is how can we conduct damage assessment through remote sensing imagery and also the power of the crowd analyzing those images. And we even had the Civil Air Patrol volunteers analyzing the images themselves since they are also a volunteer group. Why not tap them, the people who took the photos, but also um, others that were willing to uh, analyze these photos during the volunteer time. Another great example I love giving is from the humanitarian open street map team. So um, especially in the case of say the ha Haiti earthquake, in Puerto Rico it is also an area that's not well mapped. And so over um, a period of a month or so, there were over 5,400 volunteers that basically mapped 1.4 million buildings and 45,000 kilometers of roads. 
So a really great example of, you know, all these volunteers painstakingly looking at pre-satellite images and tracing the buildings and roads. Another set of examples I just want to mention is how we've been leveraging crowdsourced data from the private sector. And specifically, we worked with Waze to leverage uh, their data um, uh, from this platform that already exists. So instead of trying to create this from scratch, leverage an existing platform and get the real-time updates. Uh, this has been used by U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to uh, create their trackability map. We also leveraged Gas Buddy, which is another example of a crowdsourcing platform where people, in addition to identifying cheap gas, but also a way to identify where there's no gas or no power in an area that's been affected by a, a disaster. And so the Department of Energy has actually been integrating that Gas Buddy data in their DOE situation reports as well. One last example I want to mention is how we've been actually working with Google and leveraging their busyness data. So anytime a uh, group or anytime someone just walks with their phone into an establishment, uh, sometimes Google is able to track how long they've been there um, and they provide typical popular times in which that establishment is busy. And then that red uh, dot there, that red bar is really to indicate the current um, busyness. And so we've been working with them to kind of aggregate different establishments such as by supermarkets or or Home Depot kind of stores and figure out how busy and how um, is there a wait time, is there not, are these uh, establishments actually starting to open up and are they starting to recover? So a lot of the effort in FEMA is really pushing towards organizing these various types of emergency management information into these community lifelines. And so our goal is to try to identify crowdsource activities under these various lifelines. So just uh, here's an example of a variety of crowdsourced maps that were developed in response to Hurricane Maria. We kind of created this map journal, but our next goal is to kind of create these operational dashboards to kind of show when is it that's useful for crowdsourced data. Sometimes it's a temporal thing, the timeliness of this data. Sometimes it's a, a spatial aspect of being able to gather this data in a different area than we would otherwise uh, get through official efforts. So I hope that was a whirlwind tour of some of the hazard and disaster related crowdsourcing and science projects. If you're interested in learning more, feel free to contact me and also this FEMA crowdsourcing unit email that we have. Thank you very much. And so we are happy to um, answer any questions that you might have and have an open discussion about some of the effort in this federal community. All right, so we do have a question. Um, can you talk about how long it takes to mobilize volunteers to collect data? For example, the hospital map project, um, should one assume that volunteers were mobilized after the earthquake? Um, can you repeat that, mobilized after the earthquake? Yeah, oh, yeah, should I one assume that volunteers were mobilized after the earthquake or were folks kind of in place before the earthquake? So it kind of depends. So did you feel it is really, we want to target people that actually felt an earthquake and then just go on their mobile phone own or computer when it is safe, when they're able to do so, and just share their shaking experience. And then that information is then fed directly into our earthquake maps. And USGS is um, mandated to provide seismic information across the world on uh, earthquakes. Um, for Twitter, you know, same idea where we're just mining Twitter data um, and of people actually feeling an earthquake. But there's um, volunteers that we leverage in terms of with FEMA of digital volunteers who are not really maybe directly affected by the disaster, um, but are able to provide help in curating information online, such as social media or on traditional channels, as well as um, official channels to create these crowdsource maps. Um, so we have a It's a great question. Um, obviously, we talked a little bit about emerging technologies and projects becoming um, increasingly online. Uh, but I think we're all recognizing the importance of co-creative and collaborative projects. So not just using a we build it and they will come model, which is uh, still going to be used for some projects, larger scale, uh, distributed projects. But uh, there's been a lot of power being shown and engagement of communities that may not otherwise be engaged when an organization takes time to work with the community members to come up with the question and create the project in, in collaboration with them. Um, so I, I do think, and I, I certainly hope that there'll be a uh, continued increase in these collaborative projects and building um, platforms and tools 
that allow for that uh, small scale community based creation of, of projects. Um, and the federal government's role in possibly supporting those. And ideally, this is me speaking personally, I hope our field becomes so successful that we put ourselves out of business, that crowdsourcing and citizen science uh, cease being unique ways, to do th unique ways to do things and they just become part of the way we do science and we do business every day. Yeah, I also agree. I think there's a lot of crowdsourcing happening already. And um, one example is every time you fill out an online form and you need to kind of identify that you're not a robot, you often have to identify, you know, do you, uh, which images um, are, have stop signs or crosswalks. And that essentially is a crowdsource activity. So I often explain how we often need this crowdsource data in some ways to inform machine learning and artificial intelligence um, is one direction that I see happening already and how we are constantly being um, asked to provide crowdsource data. If you ever use uh, any Google products like Google Maps, they're constantly asking for information of how long was the wait time there. Um, uh, we're, we're often, I think, increasingly wanting to look at recommendations of an establishment. That's also a form of crowdsource data. But yeah, I think uh, we're seeing how we really, especially in the federal government where there's sometimes a reduced reduction in resources, we're increasingly need to, to think more innovatively about how we leverage um, not only just the crowd and the public, but how we can create a partnership with them and understand how can they help us improve crowdsource, um, I'm sorry, science or government services, but also um, understand and, and appreciate uh, what we're trying to do and work with them in making these services even better. All right, so speaking of government services, do you all have any examples um, of citizen science being used in the financial sector? Uh, financial areas? Yeah, let's see. I think in some ways, um, I wonder blockchain has some connection to it. Uh, having an understanding of um, a ledger and, and keeping track of how things are, um, how, thing, how information has changed over time. Um, and fintech or the financial tech sector, I think, is sort of picking up on some of these efforts and Bitcoin being an example of one. Uh, it's not an area I think a lot of us are familiar with since we're more in the science. Um, we work with a lot more science agencies, but I think there's a lot of potential for thinking of crowdsourcing in different ways. I mean, one, one connection that I've always had, especially with my background in human-centered design and user conducting usability studies is how we need to, um, how we need to actually understand our users. And so in any industry, including the financial area, um, how we can connect better with our uh, customers and improve these efforts. Uh, how can we maybe visualize the data in a better way um, by leveraging data visualization tools and how that might inform financial data. Um, so I think it doesn't have to be exclusively one area. Uh, I think there are different ways in which we can leverage customers, the public, certain um, industries certain areas and communities more effectively. Do you see some of your um, guests like the idea or like the analogy of crowdsourcing a little bit? So mm -hmm. on the crowdsourcing side, you did talk about, um, you know, you did talk about um, thinking through applications for um, the financial sector. Another form of crowdsourcing is prize competitions, and there have been prize competitions for the financial sector. Um, what are some of the biggest challenges you've encountered with the use of crowdsourcing and citizen science tools in the federal government? So one challenge we're uh, constantly running up against is a question of the quality of the data. Um, and uh, that's, that's a legitimate question. We always want to make sure our data and our programs are of uh, sufficient quality that they can meet their intended purpose. Um, sometimes their intended purpose is not to create research quality data though. Sometimes they're looking at indicators or um, they're creating a data set that's gonna help complement a, a larger, more robust data set. Um, so getting people to understand that um, there is not necessarily one set quality of data that must be applied to all projects, but rather a project needs to uh, select and figure out what 
level of data quality they need for their goals and the issues they are looking to address. Um, and trying to uh, also get out the point that this is an evolving field. And so what we've seen in citizen science uh, 10 years ago is not what we're seeing now. And the ability of the, the ability of projects to engage volunteers in a whole host of new ways that just weren't feasible um, before technologies empowered them um, is also an, also an area we're really trying to get the word out and um, trying to break that conception that citizen scientists are only environmental data collectors. Um, that's certainly an important part of what citizen scientists do, but it's uh, just a tip to the iceberg of what they're doing now, what they can do in the future. Um, what types of lessons learned would you like to share with other team members based on your experience with Red PBS? I think uh, we've done a great job in um, thinking of how do we leverage different, how do we organize and develop these projects. Um, I think ideally we want to make sure that we're not recreating wheels, so that's kind of the goal of the catalog and developing this toolkit is to make sure that we start to share what we're all doing um, and leveraging what already exists rather than creating a new project. Sometimes um, it takes a long time to kind of build a community, build a, a set of volunteers. And so I think there's a lot of efforts in trying to figure out, well, how can we leverage an existing project and maybe collaborate and partner with them to um, expand um, you know, or extend an ex existing project to meet a different need or a similar need. Um, also, I think, there's a growing need to leverage some of these platforms like Zooniverse or SciStarter where they already have uh, volunteers and they just are looking for other projects. And um, these platforms are increasingly trying to provide some analytics around how, how many volunteers they have, how, what kind of projects that they're interested in. It's not like a birder's only interested in birding projects. What other projects are they interested in attend, of participating in? So I think there's a lot of um, efforts to expand and scale these efforts up even more so beyond just uh, one single project and one project manager. I agree with everything I'd say. Another lesson is to listen to your community members. I think that's something that comes up for us over and over again is uh, making sure we're being responsive. And as we've grown from a small group of people sitting around literally at a table here in Washington, D.C. at the start to a large distributed group, making sure we're uh, allowing an experience that that grows and adequately meets all the people um, that are now seeing themselves as uh, with, within our tent that we, we welcome. And then as uh, Sophia so nicely highlighted, it's such a dynamic community, there are so many potential partners out there, how we're able to uh, keep track of those partners and best connect with them. And that's part of why we're excited about the webinar series. Um, in the presentation, you showed a chart of users over time. Can you provide a sense of how many of those users are citizen scientists and volunteers versus federal agencies using the data? So there, uh, there are two charts I can think of, um, and I'll go back to those. Um, the first was a plot of uh, the use of citizen science and crowdsourcing, or the use of citizen science within uh, the web of science, well, apologies, I'm going to go through these slides pretty quickly to get, oh, I actually uh, escape out of this, um, bring back to the slide I want to be at. Um, the first was um, a plot of um, the appearance of citizen science in the web of science, um, this plot here. And I will say this is not federal, um, restricted, this is uh, any time the, the term citizen science has um, appeared in the, in the literature. Um, so for that particular time series, there uh, is no restriction to federal. Uh, the other time series was the usage of our uh, site, citizenscience.gov. Um, and so this is uh, usage by month, and I went through this pretty quickly. Uh, but this is each month and, month and how many sessions our site has had. Uh, the site is designed to support the federal workforce specifically. Um, that's what the Crowdsourcing and Citizen Science Act uh, legislates it to do. Um, but it is 
open to the public, so all the resources are publicly available. Um, so these sessions do represent federal users as well as non-federal. Are there agencies that currently have ways that they are actively supporting community-driven collaborative projects? Yeah, there's been a variety of different agencies approaching this in, in various ways. So we've got some agencies such as the U.S. Forest Service where they uh, have a citizen science fund um, to specifically target certain projects that they uh, focus on and, and work with outside members, but in collaboration with the U.S. Forest Service. Um, NIH and NSF has also various grants where they've been supporting these efforts. Um, I don't know if you want to add anything related to that. I think there's a lot of different approaches in which um, EPA's developed a, uh, a, recently they developed a quality, data quality assurance handbook uh, to make it easier, in addition to EPA kind of figuring out um, what standards they have around um, environmental kind of quality related efforts such as uh, water quality. Um, this is a way to help them meet with the, meet the, the interests and needs of the community members that are already starting to collect some data especially using low cost sensors like water quality sensors to um, be hopefully useful and meet the standards um, for some of the needs that they have. When you look through our catalog of projects, um, one thing that may jump out of you is how many of these projects are created in collaboration, either between more than one agency um, or more commonly between agencies and uh, non-governmental partners. And uh, the report to Congress that's coming out this spring really zeroes in on that and looks at how high this percentage is of projects uh, that are uh, run in collaboration. Um, so I think that's, that's something our community aims to do. And partnering with the Citizen Science Association um, is definitely a way in which we help uh, reach the broader field. Um, we've hosted Meet the Feds and Meet the Funders sessions at uh, each of the last two Citizen Science Association conferences. There have been three conferences to date. Um, so really trying to uh, better connect what we're doing here in the federal government um, with, with the broader field and the potential partners. Um, do you have different ways of evaluating uh, the ethics and logistics of creating projects with for-profit tech companies? So for example, utilizing WAVES data. Um, have you done any outreach campaigns to let users know the social good their information is creating? Good question. Yeah, that's an int uh, interesting question. Um, we just started leveraging some of that data, at least with FEMA, and I think there's a lot of interest even with um, the National Park Service and other folks that uh, manage the roads uh, to also leverage similar data. So I think it would be, we, we haven't focused on, you know, the, the for-profit or how they're leveraging. Waze does have a um, program called Connected Citizens where they leverage federal, state, local level data and you can partner with them. So in addition to leveraging the crowdsource data that people provide in terms of identifying, you know, where there are hazards or someone, um, a camera, a red light camera or, you know, a police on the road. Um, it's also uh, allowing uh, official kind of information to be pushed into this uh, platform as well. So it's not just a crowdsource platform. I think there could be more effort and, and some effort already exists on how these um, private sector companies are working with uh, various partners, including the federal government, to make this data more useful. Uh, I think Facebook has been one area or one um, partner where we don't directly work with them. They, they kind of have an understanding of some of what we do. They mostly only work with um, nonprofits and other organizations that are on the ground responding to a disaster, but they've really created a whole host of disaster maps that have been uh, very useful in understanding have people evacuated or not, um, and a variety of other kinds of information that could be used for very uh, useful purposes for social good. So I think there's a real interest and need to want to shape and frame and provide the stories around how their data, in addition to just kind of being sold by companies to um, you know, sell you things, it's actually actually could be useful for understanding the population and how people are moving around, how, how people um, are uh, recovering from a disaster in this case. And the question of partnering with for-profits, I think that decision's really been made at the agency scale currently. Um, we don't have much guidance about the ethics of that. It's a great, great question, but we don't have much guidance at the federal level 
um, rather each agency kind of works with their general counsel um, to determine what's appropriate for them. Um, the second part of the question about providing recognition to participants about uh, discoveries that happen or findings from projects, um, that's an important one that I do wanna zero in on a little bit. Um, we talk about this in our toolkit, um, like uh, creating and sustaining community component, that that communication with the community is key. Um, it's a best practice that all of our projects should be doing. Um, so letting the community know this is what, thank you for your contributions, and this is what we've been able to do with those contributions. Um, and research also shows that if you don't have that two-way communication with the community, they're not gonna stick around for long. Um, they might think your project is neat and it's interesting and they may want to participate, but if they're not hearing back from you or not seeing any results to what they're contributing, um, people aren't gonna just sit there and keep contributing um, ad nauseum. Um, so having that two-way communication is key. And we've had some projects that really have done exemplar work in this regard, including uh, publishing papers with uh, the citizen science volunteers named as co-authors. Okay. Well, going back to, um, uh, going back to uh, humanitarian question, related to citizen engagement and disaster response, are you working to build the community of these volunteers to be on the ready? before disaster happens, or is it more of an on-demand recruitment process, similar to your own question there? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, definitely, we, we always see interest in when a disaster occurs, um, and based on previous uh, instances, like the Haiti earthquake and other, other situations, other disasters, where there's an interest to want to help. And I think it's a great opportunity to feel like, instead of just donating money, uh, just donating your time uh, and expertise in being able to mine various online sources is definitely something that people want to do. We are recognizing the need to uh, work with some of these digital volunteer networks early on so that it's not just right when a disaster happens. And sometimes a lot of these volunteer groups often get overloaded uh, by working for so long straight. Sometimes there's a lot of disasters, not just in the U.S., but around the world that they're responding to. And so they get kind of tapped and a little um, overflowed, but with um, being able to respond. So there's an effort right now actually to build up and, and connect with the digital volunteers. Um, so if you're interested in learning more, feel free to contact us at the FEMA crowdsourcing um, email. And uh, one project that we're working on when it's typically we have been only activated for hurricane season, but another activity that we've been participating in is the national level exercise. So we did that last year, which was a hurricane kind of scenario. This year it's um, an earthquake scenario called Shaken Fury. And so again, we're using this as a way to continue to collab collect, I'm sorry, connect and collaborate with our digital volunteers and develop products like an operational dashboard so that when it comes to the time when we're activated again, we have already established these relationships and worked with more people um, have a better understanding of our standard operating procedures of how to coordinate together uh, so that we are ready for the next uh, incident that might occur. So yes, it's actually really important that we try to continue that collaboration early on and not just during a disaster. I don't see any other questions, but people are talking about some of their favorite citizen science projects. Globe is one, and then Coco Ross is another. Do you all want to talk a little bit about what you want to talk a little bit about? Those? We can't talk about favorites because we love them all equally, <laughs> Tammy. Go <laughs> specifically um, that someone mentioned. Yeah. Coco Ross is a great one. So those are actually two projects that I participated in. Obviously, the yeah. Haiti Open Street Fund is another phenomenal project. The first two are. Uh, two I participate in, and I could talk for the entire hour about either one of them. I'll try to refrain. Um, GLOBE is the program that actually got me into citizen science, mm -hmm. um, and it is a uh, network originally of K-12 schools, but it's since broadened to expand to uh, any participants um, who are collecting Earth system measurements of citizen science. So it offers a wealth of uh, measurements that you can collect in tools to do uh, student research um, and environmental research using those tools. And uh, there's literally tens of millions of data points that have been collected 
over the 25 plus year history of the program um, and some, some amazing student research projects as well. Um, so it's a neat project uh, to uh, check out globe.gov being the URL to do so. Um, and then Kokoraz, uh, I actually was just working this weekend to reinstall my rain gauge um, and create a new post. Uh, the uh, Kokoraz really looks at precipitation and the water cycle and the main measurement is a uh, plastic tube uh, rain gauge um, that you install on a post and measure how much precipitation falls, which is much more exciting than it sounds. Mm -hmm. um, I will get jazzed to know how much rain fell after a given storm. And so to go out in the morning to, to uh, read the gauge is actually uh, um, embarrassingly fun and interesting. Um, and some really important discoveries are coming out of this program. Um, program started in Fort Collins, Colorado. Through Kogara's data, they discovered that the northern uh, portion of the city is uh, drier than the southern part of, part of the city um, from what I believe every year um, in the program. And it's also led to the savings of lives and property. Uh, this program has a partnership with our National Weather Service. And when a Kogara's observer uh, observes a uh, abnormally extreme weather event, they report that and it gets uh, routed directly to the relevant National Weather Service office, often leading to an earlier issuance of uh, watches and warnings. Um, so uh, Coco Raz, C-O-C-O-R-A-H-S dot org is the URL to go to visit, to learn more or to join. Um, and I will stop there. We got a reminder that um Citizen Science Day. April 13th yeah. is Citizen yeah. Science Day. What are you all going to be doing on Citizen Science Day? So working on, but I think uh, one of the main pushes um, with SciStart and some other agencies is the Alzheimer's um, project. What's it called again? The Megathon. The Megathon. And uh, I think it's a great project where in addition to pushing it out to the crowd and um, using this day as a way to kind of raise awareness about it and get more volunteers, I think it's been great how they've gone to different nursing homes, right, to kind of engage uh, those senior communities to actually develop or um, participate. And it helps them, you know, keep their mind active. And in some ways, maybe their contributions can help themselves, <laughs> essentially, in the future for Alzheimer's related research. Uh, I don't know if you have any other thoughts that you wanted to say about Citizen Science Day. And yeah, uh, it's just a nice day to celebrate what we do. And uh, this year, the focus on the stall catchers, Alzheimer's game, that's a few just nice overview is, I think, a, a very worthy, uh, worthy goal to try to do, uh, do one year of research in one day um, through the power of the crowd. Um, we at NOAA will have a web story coming out um, that's going to highlight a few programs as well, including uh, linking people to the megathon and how to participate. Yeah, and uh, I think one interesting thought I had in sharing is like with the Haiti earthquake, it, it is um, it was a great example, and there's some great videos that do a time lapse of how. Uh, over a short period of time, within a few days and just in a week, they were um, mappers around the world were able to map uh, Haiti very quickly. And so that visualization kind of communicates the power of the crowd over a period of time uh, and, and being able to do a painstaking task of tracing buildings and roads using old satellite imagery. Uh, and so, you know, that, that activity, it, sometimes these are tedious things. So the humanitarian open street map team, they've been um, engage, uh, encouraging mapathons, and um, there's a youth mappers group as well. So there's a lot of mapping, uh, you know, efforts that happen, and mapathons are just one fun way to bring people together to do a fairly uh, monotonous task. But something that I thought I'd mention too with the iCoast project that I mentioned, where we show aerial photos of the coast before and after storms, uh, we we were also at USGS leveraging this um, program we have called STEP, where it engages with young adults that have um, sometimes I call them people with special abilities than disabilities, but they have uh, some form of maybe autism or something like that where uh, in some ways a very repetitive task and a very visual task uh, is something they enjoy doing. And so uh, some of our top users were those kinds of folks that were volunteering for this program. So I think there's just a lot of interesting ways where we can connect with very specific kinds of crowds or populations, not just anyone online or just not any member of the public, but really targeting and being effective in how we engage with 
uh, potential users and, and volunteers and contributors. And so maybe time for at least one more question. Um, there's this little bit of a conversation happening online. Someone asks, do you know of any platforms that enable people to develop really simple smartphone apps for their citizen science projects and enable reporting geolocated information? One person suggested that iNaturalist might be um, a platform to consider, um, but perhaps there are others yeah, there's, um, Esri's got some ArcGIS Online kind of tools, Survey123 and Collector. Um, one is a little more geared towards, uh, so Collector I think is a little geared towards geospatial kind of collections. Um, and then Survey123 is sort of just basically a form that you can develop of your mobile phone. So I don't want to um, single out any particular private uh, sector company, but, um, and US Forest Service has developed uh, some webinars around using these tools. Uh, there's other various online tools like that, but iNaturalist is a good one where it's already kind of been developed and set up for specific types of collections um, of the environment. But a more generic tool is things like Survey123 and Collector. There's also a lot of other online platforms, but in terms of more mobile device types, um, that those seem to be an initial one, but at a cost. And we showed our toolkit and uh, uh, steps and resources for uh, writing projects. One thing it doesn't currently have that's been identified as a gap we'd like to add is platforms in terms of technologies to use. Um, so we've kind of identified this within our community as something we want to uh, work to uh, add to our toolkit. Um, so stay tuned on that and hopefully that will also provide some uh, links to, to useful platforms to create projects and, and data collections and data management apps. And that's live at citizenscience.gov slash toolkit. Right? Exactly. Thank you, Tamara. Yeah. On citizen, the toolkit on citizenscience.gov, correct. Okay. Yeah, there's, I think, a lot of interest and in a lot of existing open source tools out there. So I think we can definitely leverage um, what's out there. And we want to be a resource for at least some of the work that's happening in the federal government. Thank you. Oh, great. Well, thank you both for helping to launch this first episode of the Federal Crowdsourcing Series and for this really rich introduction to citizen science and what so many federal agencies are doing powered with people power, public people power. Um, just, to note for, just to note for those folks who are still watching, we do have some upcoming webinars in the series on May 14th. We'll talk about challenge.gov, which is a program managed GSA to build capacity for agencies to run prize competitions that engage the public. Um, on June 11th, we'll be talking with the U.S. Census Bureau about the Opportunity Project. On July 9th, we'll be talking to the Open Opportunity Team uh, within the Office of Personnel Management. And on August 13th, we'll um, highlight um, the history by the people coming from the Library of Congress. So, um, please look for information in your follow-on materials. You'll be receiving a survey. We encourage you to take the survey. Tell us what you'd like to see, what we can and do better for you next time. And thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you all for the time. and excited for these uh, future webinars and learning more about our fellow communities. <laughs>